everyone, we are thrilled this evening to have two wonderful authors of historical fiction joining us. Um, first up, I'm going, I'm going to introduce them both and then they're going to both talk about their new books. Um, Carrie Callahan is a great friend to the Northshire. Some of you may have been in the store when she visited uh, shortly after the publication of her debut novel, A Light of Her Own. That was a really lovely uh, event and it's wonderful to see her again, even remotely. Um, her short fiction has appeared in Weave Magazine, The MacGuffin, Silk Road, Floodwall, and elsewhere. She's also an editor and a contributor to, with the Washington Independent Review of Books. And she is with us tonight celebrating her new novel, Salt Snow. And then our other guest author this evening is Alyssa Palumbo. She is the author of The Violinist of Venice, The Most Beautiful Woman in Florence, and The Spellbook of Katrina Van Tassel. And she's with us tonight to talk about her latest book, The Borgia Confessions. Please join me in welcoming them both to the Northshire. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you, thank you so much thank for you having us. Go ahead, Alyssa. All right, so I'm going to kick things off. Um, I'm going to start by talking about, um, as Rachel said, my most recent novel, um, which is The Borgia Confessions. And there's the cover, you can all see. Um, so this, this novel is about uh, the infamous Borgia family, um, who some of you may be familiar with, but a quick rundown just in case you're not. Um, they were a family who rose to power in late 15th century Italy when the patriarch Rodrigo Borgia was elected pope. He became Pope Alexander VI, and uh, him, him and his children kind of, you know, rose to prominence and, and had a, a really heavy influence on the politics of the era. Uh, there was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of scandal where they're concerned. So that makes a uh, really good, um, really good setup to write a novel about them. Um, I'm certainly not the first. I'm sure I won't be the last. There, there's quite a few novels that take on this family. Um, so for me, um, I really, I discovered the Borgia family when I was a teenager and I was just always immediately completely fascinated by them. And so I always kind of wanted to write a book about them. Um, this novel is told in two alternating points of view. Um, one point of view is Cesare Borgia, who is an actual historical figure. He was the eldest son of Rodrigo Borgia. Um, he's also kind of, in my view, the true villain of the family. He's the real, the real bad guy. Um, so I kind of wanted to write his villain origin story, so to speak, and explore, you know, how, how he got to be the villain that history kind of knows him as. So that was sort of the, the premise of the book going in. And then the other perspective um, in the book is that of Madalena Moretti, who is a fictional character that I invented. And she is a maid who works first in the Vatican Palace and then for Lucrezia Borgia, the Pope's daughter. And she becomes privy to certain Borgia secrets. She gets really entangled with uh, what goes on in the family, um, you know, and she, she knows, knows things she maybe wishes she doesn't know and gets really involved in all of the drama that goes on. So um, as I said, the, the book alternates between those two perspectives and it shows kind of an upstairs downstairs view of the family. And that was actually something really important to me in writing the book was that I purposely wanted to explore what power and corruption looks like from both the perspective of one of the powerful and also from one of the powerless. So that those two alternating perspectives really gave me the space to do that. Um, I, as I think I said, I, I had really always wanted to write a book about the Borgias um, ever since ever since I first discovered them. Um, and this book is really honestly kind of a dream come true in a way uh, because I started writing this book many times. I actually started noodling around with the idea when I was still in college. Um, you know, I, I got a couple starts to it. And then once I sold my first novel, uh, The Violinist of Venice, I sold that as part of a two book deal to St. Martin's Press. So I went back to this Borgia's book, thought that was gonna be book number two and it kind of wasn't working. Um, I had sent it to my, what I had so far to my agent. She really liked it, but felt like something was missing. So I kind of put that aside. I wrote my second novel, The Most Beautiful Woman in Florence. After that one, I went back to the Borgias again. It still wasn't quite right. Um, so I wrote my third novel. And then after that one, I had, I went back to the Borgias book again, and I finally found the missing piece was to add Madalena's perspective. I had always kind of envisioned writing a book just from Cesare's point of view. But as I said, something was not missing. That was just kind of not, not enough. And so I, at that point, came up with the idea to add in this perspective of Madalena, who is a, a servant who works for the family. 
And um, I kind of stole from myself in doing that because actually when I was in college, I wrote a short story from the perspective of a maid who gets involved with Cesare Borgia. And so when I was kind of looking for the missing piece of this novel, I went back to that short story and I was like, oh, he here it is. This, this missing piece has been here all along. And so I, I basically combined those two and uh, the novel finally worked out. It finally had what it needed. And um, my literary agent and I agreed. I had a couple of projects I was kind of playing around with at that time. And we both agreed that this kind of made sense as, as my next book. So uh, the rest is history. Although the rest is kind of actually a very long story of a very arduous and difficult writing process. But um, this book was really, really a challenge to write. It definitely was the biggest challenge of all my published books so far, but it's also definitely the best book I've written so far. Um, so I'm really proud of it. Probably someday I'll top it, hopefully, but I think um, I, I'm very proud of it. I'm, I'm really proud of, of how it came out. Um, so I'm actually I just want to chime in and say it is an excellent book. You have <laughs> Thank like you, Karen. I've only read one of your other books, um, so I can't say if it's the best or not, but it's a very, very good book. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to read a little bit of a selection from it. And actually, Carrie requested this passage because she thinks uh, she really likes the descriptions in it. So I hope I hope you all enjoy it as well. But this is from chapter 12, which is uh, a chapter from Madalena's point of view. And Madalena works as, uh, among other things, she's a seamstress for Lucrezia Borgia. She does embroidery, she does mending and things like that. So in this scene, what's happening is Lucrezia is getting ready for her wedding and there's a problem with her dress, so Madalena has to come and help her out. You, girl, Adriana Damila called to me, poking her head out of Lucrezia's dressing room. Come, we need your help. I rose from my usual chair where I was adding some embroidery to one of Lucrezia's shifts and turned and hurried toward her. Of course, Madonna Adriana. Lucrezia was within, being dressed for her wedding to take place that very day. I had seen much of her wedding gear over the past week, the gown, its elaborate sleeves, the new silk shoes dyed to match, some new pieces of jewelry. Yet I was unprepared for the true vision that my mistress made. When I stepped into her dressing room, I gasped. She stood in front of a tall Venetian glass mirror with Adriana, Julia, and two maids standing beside her. Her gown was of the palest blue and trimmed with gold. Gold lace at the bodice and hem, gold embroidery down the front panel, and gold ribbons on the sleeves, which were slashed to reveal a cloth of gold chemise beneath. A gold chain set with pearls wound around her head, crossing her brow and disappearing into her elaborate coiffure, where the chain was woven through the strands of her pale hair. A gold necklace set with an enormous diamond encircled her throat, along with gold rings on various fingers and dangling diamond earrings. She was breathtaking, and all who set eyes on her would think her an angel. Her eyes moved to me as I entered and, set off by the gown as they were, seemed impossibly blue. Their troubled expression widened into one of relief when she saw me. Oh, Madalena, she said, thank goodness. Come here, please, quickly. I crossed the room to her and bobbed a curtsy. How may I serve you, Madonna? There is a tear, she said, her lip trembling as though she were trying not to cry, in the hem of the dress. She pointed down and I saw where the gold lace had likely been stepped on and come away from the hem. Honestly, Lucrezia, if you had just stopped fidgeting like I told you to, Adriana began to complain, but she was silenced by a sharp, irritated gesture from her young charge. Yes, I am well aware, Lucrezia said testily, but what's done is done and it must be fixed. She turned her beseeching eyes back to me. You can fix it, can't you, Madalena? You are the most gifted seamstress I know, and if you cannot fix it, that was all, a bit of lace torn away from the hem, tension leaked from my body. I smiled with relief, hoping to put her more at ease. This is easily fixed, Madonna, I said. Have no fear. I only need you to stand in place while I mend it. Lucrezia's delicate body sighed with relief. Thank the Blessed Virgin, she murmured. Yes, of course, I shall stand for however long it takes and be grateful for it. See ya, Adriana, please get Madalena whatever she needs. I knelt to examine the lace and the hem. I looked up at Donna Adriana. I can fetch my needles from my bag in the next room. I have one fine enough for this work, I said, but I shall need gold thread. We have some somewhere, Lucrezia said. Zia Adriana, please fetch it and fetch Madeline's sewing bag as well. No, no, Madonna, I can, but Adriana was already off, gone to fetch my bag and to hunt for the gold thread. As a bride, Lucrezia was indeed queen for a day and it seemed all would do her bidding, even if her bidding was to fetch and carry for a lowly maid like myself. I allowed myself a bit of satisfaction with this turn of events. I was saving the wedding dress and, in a way, the wedding. I would need to confess this sin of pride later, but for now I allowed myself to revel in it. Within moments, Donna Adriana returned with my sewing bag and a spool of gold thread, and I got to work. So, 
that is, uh, that's my little passage I'm going to read. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and now I'm going to pass things over to Carrie, who's going to tell us about her marvelous sophomore novel, Salt the Snow. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Rachel and Tavi. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I am very sad that I'm not in Saratoga Springs right now in person. Um, it's been a tradition every year for the past something like five years. I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, the lesser spring, I guess. And it's been a tradition every year for the past five years or so to go up north and visit my dear friend, Erin, who I think is on the call. And of course, one of our mandatory stops is into Northshire, where I inevitably spend way more than I had intended to when I walk into the store. And I just, I love it. It's such a beautiful place. So, so sad not to be there with you in person, but really grateful to see you all virtually. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Salt the Snow, which is historical fiction based on a real American woman who is a journalist in Moscow in, well, she was a journalist in Moscow in the 1930s. She'd actually had a really amazing career before then, starting off uh, covering murders and fires in San Francisco, and then she chased a man to Hawaii and persuaded him to marry her, but then that ended in catastrophic divorce. And then she fled a broken heart to China, where she, you know, as one does, she covered the civil war there, um, then fled another broken heart back to San Francisco. And in a series of many, you'll, you'll sense the theme, she had a lot of really bad relationships and uh, eventually ended up in Moscow in the 1930s. So I'm going to read a very short excerpt from the beginning of the novel. This takes place uh, February 27th, 1934. And the only thing you need to know is that Millie, uh, the main character, is returning from a party with a few other of her journalist friends, and she's getting out of the car. They're dropping her off. She had her boots on, so she stepped right through a dip in the snowbank and onto the sidewalk. The cold burned her nose and made her glasses fog up, and yet there was still something beautiful about a Moscow night. As soon as the weather warmed, she and Senya, that's her Russian husband, would have to go for one of their nighttime walks again. It had been so long since they had, and by springtime, he would have fewer opera rehearsals to occupy him. She cleared her glasses with the wool of her gloved fingertips. There, parked a little way down from where she stood, was a black automobile. Millie's breath caught. None of Senya's neighbors owned a car. No ordinary Russian did. The Soviet Union was still learning how to make cars, and there weren't enough imports to go around for anyone except the government. The light of the single street lamp caressed the smooth curves of the Ford. A shiver, even colder than the winter air, drilled through her. She hurried inside the building's unlocked exterior door and shook the snow from her boots while the snoring of one of the first floor residents droned down the hallway. Then she hurried up the flight of stairs to Xenia's floor. By the top, she was taking the steps a wobbly two at a time. Then when she reached the top, she froze. The door to the apartment containing Senya's room was open and light spilled out into the dark hallway. The building was quiet. Millie walked slowly inside. From the front room, Phil belongings of Luba, a Ukrainian student assigned to the subdivided apartment, Millie could see inside Senya's room, but she couldn't see him. A man in a brown uniform with a peaked cap stood by Senya's open door. Inside, Senya's mother, Olga Ivanova, sat on the edge of her couch, her chin in her hand, and her eyes on something to her left. What's going on? Millie asked in Russian as soon as she entered the small bedroom. Senya stood in the corner, his fine skin smudged with weariness. A second uniformed man was on his knees, peering into Senya's wardrobe. He stood. I'll just stop there. That's the, that's the beginning of a, a secret police search of Senya's room, and um, you can probably guess things don't go too well for him, um, as they probably didn't for many many Russians. But so I want to, I have a question, well, I have a number of questions for Alyssa. And I think the way we're going to do this is we're going to do some back and forth uh, between us and then open it up to you all for questions. I'm looking to Rachel or David for affirmation. All right. Yep. Rachel says good. Um, so that plan is satisfactory. Um, so one of the things I love about historical fiction is that we have, you know, as writers, contemporary writers, we very much have a foot in the present, but we're reaching back and we're, we're looking quite far into the past to sort of tell in some ways contemporary stories. So that puts us in sort of a translator's position. 
Um, how did you do that? How did you reach so far back in such a compelling way? I mean, that's 500 years. <laughs> yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, I, I love, so I love the history of the Renaissance. So for me, it was really um, just kind of immersing myself in it, which wasn't a chore, certainly because I find it so interesting. Um, but, you know, trying to understand, you know, how people lived, what the politics were like, which is obviously really crucial for this particular book, um, the ways in which religion, you know, weighed on them or enhanced their lives, you know, the effects that that had, um, you know, it's, it's tough and, and you're never going to get it exactly right, um, which I think is sometimes tough for us historical fiction authors to accept. Um, but, you know, you're always going to make mistakes. You're never going to get it 100% right. As you say, you know, we are of the contemporary era and we can't, you know, I can't unknow what it's like to be a woman in America in the 21st century. You know, I can't get rid of that knowledge to put myself in the shoes of a servant girl in the 1500s or the, you know, the late 1400s. Um, so, so some of it is imagination and some of it is just doing the best with what, you know, what research materials are available to you. Um, and I, I like to, when I possibly can travel to the locations that I'm writing about and at least put myself in the physical space that, um, my characters would have occupied. And I find that that, that really helps get my imagination going for sure. Yeah. Travel. <laughs> that would be nice these yeah. days. Right? I don't yeah. think anybody's doing research for historical fiction is able to travel much at the moment. No, unfortunately not. Did you, did you go to Russia at all for this book? I did not. Um, for a number of personal reasons, it wasn't really feasible to sure. go to Russia, um, but Millie did. And I yeah. based this book on hundreds, probably, you know, maybe a thousand of her letters. And, um, and she was such a vivid correspondent. She, mm -hmm. But she really missed a lot of her friends in San Francisco, and she wrote these very wry, descriptive letters that made me feel like it was it was quite easy for me to describe what she yeah. saw because she told everybody. Um, and then one of the advantages I had that you didn't have was that there are films and photographs yeah. of Moscow in the 1930s that, um, I mean, I guess you relied on paintings some, right? Yeah, painting. I love paintings for, you know, this this kind of era when obviously there's there's no photographs or anything available. Um, my favorite thing I refer to the paintings for is clothing and hairstyles, um, because, you know, you can read descriptions of that stuff all day long, but I think it's it's really helpful to be able to see it. And of course, it, you know, a, 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 especially like a formal portrait that was painted, it's stylized. People didn't necessarily dress like that every day, but it does give you an idea and it gives you kind of a starting point. Um, for how people would would look. But yeah, that's the thing that the further back you go, the fewer primary sources that are available. Um, and two, you know, I don't, I don't read Italian fluently. So, you know, you could have handed me a diary from someone in this era and I wouldn't necessarily be able to read it. Um, so that's, that's kind of a barrier too. Um, Was but, there anything you felt like you didn't translate or that you, you knew that you couldn't include in a novel for contemporary readers that would just be too foreign or was too weird? Um, Sometimes really. with politics that like it's yeah. too foreign. Well so that was that was kind of the tricky thing with this book was that again because I was so steeped in this history and the political history especially I understood it you know inside and out and I understood all the players and, and what their motivations were um, but yeah the, the trick was to include enough information and enough detail that the reader knew what was going on, but not to overload them so that either A, it gets boring, or B, it's just, it's too much to keep track of. Because again, it's a novel, it's supposed to be entertainment as well. Um, you don't want someone to feel like they're reading a textbook. So that was one of my challenges was to find that balance. And that was where I actually leaned really heavily on my editor for that because, you know, again, while I was so steeped in this information, he wasn't. So if there was a, a point where in the manuscript where I wasn't sure if it was too much or not enough, I would kind of leave notes to her. And, you know, she would she would go in and kind of tell me like, yeah, I think, I think this is a little too heavy handed or I'm actually confused. I'm not really sure what's going on. I think I need a little bit more. And so that was really helpful for me. Yeah, I think people don't always appreciate how helpful editors are and how important yes. they are in the process. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Always, I always find that um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes when I'm talking to especially aspiring writers, I think a lot of people imagine this kind of adversarial relationship with an editor where it's like, 
oh, they're going to make me change my book and I don't want to change it. And that that's definitely not the editor's role. Like they're your creative partner. They're your collaborator. They want to help you make the book the best it can be. Yeah, and as you say, for historical fiction, where we've done so much research and we know so much, mm -hmm. it can be so useful to have that outside view, that, that sort of ignorant reader, you know, not in a pejorative sense, who can say, this isn't really being conveyed the way you want it to be conveyed. I yeah. think that's probably true for all writing. But yeah, one, one of the challenges I had in terms of trying to translate my knowledge and Millie's knowledge for contemporary readers was, writing about Soviet Union in the early 1930s, which I think Americans have, you know, even just a very basic sense that it didn't yeah. turn out well. Right. And, and yet Millie was very optimistic. She didn't know that it didn't turn out well. And right. because of the depression in America and, you know, earlier years, a lot of Americans were looking to Moscow and to the Soviet Union as a, a real possibility for something different. Mm -hmm. And that is a challenge. Um, it was a challenge for me as a writer, and I'm not sure I always met it. Um, hopefully it worked for readers, but to, to kind of create that sense of innocence um, mm -hmm. in a credible way. It's a fun, yeah. fun game. <laughs> yeah, well, I, was, I wanted to ask you about that and kind of what your research process was like and how, yeah, how you kind of maintained that sense of hopefulness that she had, which I think you did convey well throughout the book. But I know for myself, you know, as somebody who went to American public school, really all I learned about Russia was there was a revolution and then they were communists and communists were bad is like pretty much what you get <laughs> in history class. So there's, there's not a lot of nuance there, but your book brings a lot of nuance to it. Um, and so I was just hoping you could talk a little bit about that and, and how you went about the research and, and the writing of that as well. Sure. Yeah. We always love talking about our research, don't we? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I didn't actually start with Millie's letters. I mean, I had those, but I started off with first a posthumously published memoir that she had written, um, but somebody else published for her of her early years. So that was really what got me hooked on her. Just this woman who was both so screwed up in that she kept falling into these serially terrible relationships and yet so bold and so confident. Um, I thought she was such a fascinating character and I wanted to tell her story. <clears throat> so I read that and then I just read as much as I could because like you, I didn't know much about Russia either. But um, I thought it was it was very intriguing to think about this little brief moment where it looked like something was possible. And so read, um, there are some translated diaries of Russians who lived at the time. Um, there's a really, oh, I can see if I have it on my bookshelf here. I don't, I think it's downstairs. Uh, a really wonderful book called The House of Government that is a look at lives of um, elite Soviet officials who span the, the time period from the revolution in the teens all the way through the purges in the late 1930s. Um, so lots of things like that, primary sources and secondary sources. And then of course, like I said, the letters. And that's where I was really able to, to keep in touch with Millie's optimism and this very narrow road that she walked where on the one hand, she could see the bad things that were happening and she didn't want to be susceptible to the propaganda machine that she was in some ways working for. And yet she, also didn't want to be susceptible to the sort of reflexive cynicism that so many yeah. of the other international correspondents resorted to as a protective mechanism. So she was trying to live in the middle in a way that personally I find to be contemporarily important, you know, trying to yeah. keep yourself open to all sorts of different views. Yeah. So that what about, um, is there anything you wanted to share about your research or any particularly useful sources? Yeah, so I have, um, I thought I'd do a little bit of show and tell. I have some um, books that I read along the way that were really helpful. Um, so this one, it's called The Borgias, The Hidden History by um, G.J. Meyer. The, if you, I highly recommend this if you're interested in the family or in the period, because not only does it give you really the full story of their, I guess, dynasty, um, but it there's there's chapters interspersed within it that, like kind of zoom back and show you the larger political landscape at the time, which I think is really helpful. Like at first it doesn't seem like it is relevant. You know, you kind of want to, with the Borgias, you kind of want to get to the scandal and, and all of that. Um, but it's really, really crucial for understanding it. And so I had actually read this several years ago, like just for fun because I'm a nerd. <laughs> and then when I um, started writing this book, I went back to it and I read it again because I, and I, got all kinds of dog years in here for things I wanted to remember, but, um, you know, to get all of that political context again was really helpful. 
And then um, this book was actually really key for me. It's a biography of Cesare Borgia um, by Sarah Bradford. She also has a biography of Lucrezia Borgia that I relied on with this. And then there's another biography of him that I relied on pretty heavily. Um, there's not as much written about him as other Renaissance figures, like for instance, you know, Michelangelo or Da Vinci, you could find, you know, shelves full of biographies about them. But so there's really, there's only a few about him. So I relied pretty heavily on this book um, and a few others. I actually, I made an outline for this book before I started. Well, I got a little ways into the first draft and realized I couldn't go any further without outlining it. So I basically painstakingly went through all these biographies and kept cross-referencing timelines and events to like make <laughs> this enormous outline that I wrote. Um, and then this book is really helpful for just kind of some like basic, it's called Daily Life in Renaissance Italy. Um, it's really helpful for just like, I got some super basic information about like clothing, forms of address and stuff were that were in there. This is all dog-eared pages too. Um, there's way more, <laughs> but I, only, I was only able to dig out a few from my stacks in my basement. So I kind of, in my office, I have like, you know, the current research books for what I'm working on now. And then once the book's done, I kind of swap those out for the new set. So I didn't have them all handy, but um, yeah, I just read, read lots of stuff about the Borgia family, about Renaissance Italy at the time, um, about the incident of Girolamo Savonarola in Florence, because there's a whole section of the book that covers that. So I read about that. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, I, I was lucky enough to be able to go to Rome and spend some time there while I was working on the book. So that was really helpful. So again, I got to go to some of the, the locations in the book, which was really helpful. Um, yeah. I think you can feel it. it. Like I said, part of one of my favorite things about this is how vivid the world building is. Um, oh, thank you. And it, it really comes to life for some for a book that's set 500 years in the past. It's it's amazing. It's like magic. That's what's so wonderful about historical <laughs> fiction. I think it really feels like time travel. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's as close as humans are ever going to come to time travel is reading and writing historical fiction. Yeah, yeah. even more than watching a movie because watching yeah. a movie there's there's still that distance between you and the experience. But when you're mm -hmm. reading it, it's like in your brain. It's really cool. Yeah, definitely. So I wonder too, for your research, I think, I, so, I sometimes wonder with writers who write books that, you know, much more recently than I do, I think sometimes the problem I run into is I can't find the information I'm looking for. And so what I imagine your problem might be is that, is there like too much <laughs> for you to sort through? And like, how do you, how do you choose what sources and, and how do you know when you're I want to say done with your research, but like we're never really done, right? Because we always keep looking things up. But how do you how do you know when you've gotten to a point where okay, I think I can move forward with this now? Yeah, that's a great question. And my first book actually was set um, in the 17th century, so it was a yes. really strange contrast to go from having very little information, particularly about the woman I was writing about, Judith Leicester, a painter who left you know no records of her own except for you know a couple a couple notes. Um, to having you know thousands of documents, and uh, yeah, it was a challenge. That's all I'll say. You know, it was a different <laughs> exercise in storytelling. In the first one, I was pushing myself to invent things that would plausibly fit within the few dots I knew about her lifetime, and in this one, it was more taking all of that material and then trying to shape it into something that is a narrative. Because as you said, books ought to be entertaining, so yeah. you know we're trying to to take a life and turn it into a plot, but lives don't yeah. always have narrative arcs. So yep. <laughs> uh, there can be a little bit of invention there. Um, yeah. I see somebody asked where I found the letters and I'll answer that really quickly. It was um, Millie, I think she knew that she was an important lady and so um, she didn't have any children. And when she died, she left her papers to a friend. That friend passed it on to another friend who donated them to the Hoover Institution Library in Stanford. And so all of her papers are there in the library. And actually, if I can figure out how to do this, I wanna show you just really briefly one of her letters so you can see what it looks like. Oh, okay, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> hey, I, can make you, I can make you a co-host so you can share if you want. Okay, yeah, yeah, it'll just be real quick, but I think it's kind of fun Yeah. to see. And this one has this really insouciant poem that she wrote um, that I think also gives you a sense of Millie's personality. Um, all right, so I think now I can do it. There we go. All right, so 
This is just one of the many letters that Millie wrote back. This one was from early in her time in Moscow. She's writing to her friend Rosie, um, and she's talking about how the, um, the Soviets, because they were trying to disprove religion, had unearthed a lot of saints um, that the, you know, the, I guess the Tsars had told people and the Orthodox Church had told people that these bodies would be uncorrupted and pure. And so the Soviets made a rather gruesome museum out of these oh degraded bodies. Um, and so she visited this museum and was kind of being cavalier about it. Um, she, she wanted to write a story about it, but she knew it wouldn't get past the censors. So she's telling her friend, I'd write my story, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If the worms don't get you, the Bolsheviks must. <laughs> Um, and you know, she just goes on like that. So, um, so that's all, let's see, stop share. That's all I wanted to show about that. Um, so yeah, the letters are in the library and, um, talking about travel, one of the amazing things I found out, and maybe you've done this too, Alyssa, is, um, now you don't have to, with the internet, you don't have to actually travel, even though these documents weren't available online. I just hired a researcher to go and take photographs of them. You just saw one. And then she put them onto um, Dropbox and or Google Drive and then you know boom so for much less than a week uh, trip to Stanford yeah I got a researcher did you do that perfect no I actually have not I never thought of that <laughs> but that's actually that's a really good idea I'll have to keep that in mind for the future um, I'm doing it now too for my current research project oh, yeah. not to nerd out too much on research but, <laughs> um, but my next project is set in Spain and I can't go to Spain right now. So I'm working with an out of work tour guide um, and asking her questions. And so she very kindly is like driving around to parts of the city and taking videos and sending it back to me. Nice. So it's That's as awesome. good as I can get. <laughs> Where in Spain? Now I'm a little bit nosy about what you're working on. <laughs> uh, Granada. <sighs> I want to go there. Yeah. Busy. Don't we want to go there? It would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to hear about Cesare's uh, Sorry, Cesare? Cesare? Cesare, yeah. Cesare, I don't speak Italian. His relationship <laughs> with his father. It's so interesting. Yeah, so that was a lot <laughs> to kind of unpack. Um, so basically, so as I mentioned, Cesare was the eldest son of Rodrigo Borgia. And he was, by all accounts, um, he had a temper, but he was very intelligent, um, you know, very sharp. He had a brilliant mind for strategy and things like that. Um, and his father insisted that he, and this is all, this all really happened, by the way. It's in the book, but it all really happened. Um, his father insisted that he follow him into the church. So when um, Rodrigo Borgia was elected Pope in 1492, he made his son, who was 16 or 17 at the time, he made him the Archbishop of Valencia. And then when he was 18, he made him a cardinal, which was unheard of for someone to be made a cardinal at such a young age. And there was actually a lot of opposition within the College of Cardinals because they were like, you know, this is clearly nepotism, what's going on. But uh, the Pope had pretty absolute power at the time. So, you know, people complained, but there wasn't really much they could do. Um, but Cesare did not want to, did not want to go into the church. He never wanted to be a cardinal. Um, and he, he always wanted to be a general. He wanted to kind of lead armies for the church um, and help his, kind of the original goal was to bring the papal states back under control, which to go into like a brief, a brief uh, side trip here, um, the papal states were a region of Italy around Rome of which the Pope was the secular ruler as well as, you know, being their spiritual leader. And so the, all the lords of the papal states technically owed feudal allegiance to the Pope. But um, by 1492, that had kind of disintegrated and these, these lords and princes of these varying little city states kind of did whatever they want. Um, so Pope Alexander wanted to kind of bring them back under the yoke of the church and, and make them sort of acknowledge him as their, their secular overlord. So Jesuit wanted to lead the armies that would do that, um, but Pope Alexander instead made Cesare's younger brother Juan Borgia kind of the family's general. Um, Juan Borgia was, by all accounts, a terrible person and not very, not a very smart one. And he was actually kind of a tough character to write because all of the, everything I read about him, pretty much all his stuff, everything I read kind of agreed that, yeah, he was the worst. Like, there really was not a lot of redeeming qualities about this guy. So I'm like, how do I make him kind of interesting? Um, but, so that was kind of tough. But anyway, so, so Cesare resents his brother very much, and he resents his father for kind of forcing him onto this path that he didn't choose. And so that tension 
really carries throughout the whole book, both in how Cesare interacts with his father and with his brother. Um, and it kind of, it comes, it comes to a head. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the eternal part of these stories are the interpersonal elements, right? And I think you did such a good job of capturing that. Very unique, I mean, the, the idea that a supposedly celibate Pope is installing his children all over the place <laughs> is uh, yeah. a challenge in and of itself, you know, speaking back to like how we kind of get over the the moral qualms we might have today about things that happened in the past. Um, but yeah, the, the way you depicted the family relationships was just wonderful, really fun. Thank you. Um, so how, I guess one thing I was curious about, I know you said um, Millie didn't have any children, but does she have any living relatives? Like are there people alive that knew her? Because that's something that always sort of I feel hung up on when I think about writing about a historical figure who is more recent is that, do they have family around? You know, like when people have been dead 500 years, it's kind of like, okay, <laughs> you you have a little bit more free reign in that sense. But I, so I was just interested in in hearing you talk about how you, how you created her character based on her letters. And then also, yeah, does she have any, was there anyone you were able to speak to who knew her or, or was related or anything like that? I tried to find someone who knew her, partly because I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to violate any copyright laws because the mm. archives couldn't say who owns the copyright. They said, we have them, but we don't know who owns the copyright because we don't know who her descendants are. Um, mm. So I tried to find who it was and, and just couldn't find anyone. Um, yeah. And it's interesting, you, you know, you said talking previously about maybe some misconceptions um, other or unpublished writers have about about publishing and I know there's a lot of concerns among people about like are you going to get sued for what you've written or yeah. are you going to get involved with some kind of defamation and I have found people in my experience to be just exceedingly nice so, you know nobody's mm -hmm. ever given me a hard time and to quote a story from another writer um, who wrote about someone in the 20th century she um, this I think it was Marie Benedict I'm pretty sure that's the writer who told this story she was saying that um she wrote a fictional character, well, real life character, but she sort of fictionalized it. She had a lot of research on it and she was a little bit nervous about how people would react because she, this person was involved in a, um, an affair with a married person. And she ended up getting a letter from the family and, you know, sort of hesitantly, she opens the letter to read it and they thanked her for telling them all these things that they didn't know about their oh. grandmother. And they thought it was just lovely to have all this new knowledge about her life. And so, you know, I think people maybe are nicer than we give them credit for. Yeah. But in any case, I haven't had any negative experiences with people saying that's not how it was. And all of the <laughs> characters in my book who are real people, I gave their real names. I didn't. <laughs> change names or anything. I know sometimes people do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, yeah, I, I, I've talked to other authors who have either gotten permission from family members or at least spoken to them in, in things. And like I said, that always kind of trips me up when I think about writing about something closer to the present is I think I would make it, you know, kind of loosely based on someone, but, but then at the same time, I think books like yours really bring to life these heroines that I think we should know about. And so I'm glad that I'm glad that you and others are writing about them. I think I might be nervous, but <laughs> it might not be as bad as you fear. You maybe someday you can give it a try. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I want to ask you about another character who's more of a minor character in your book, but she really stood out for me. Um, and I'm probably going to mispronounce her name too. Uh, Sancia? Sancia. Yeah. Sancia. Yes. Um, so like, Tell us where she came from and kind of who she is, what, what role she plays in the book. Yeah, so she is also a real historical figure. Um, she married Joffrey Borgia, who was the youngest son. She was the illegitimate granddaughter of King Ferrante of Naples. Um, so the marriage was arranged to kind of bring the papacy into closer alliance with the Kingdom of Naples. And um, when they got married, Joffrey was 12 or 13 and Sancho was, I think, 16. Um, that was kind of that was kind of how these political marriages worked back then. Um, yeah, but she yeah she was a real historical figure. Um, she had affairs with both Cesare and Juan Borgia. In addition to being married to their brother, um, that is a matter for the historical record. Um, she actually Wait, I, hold on. I want to know how do people know that? Like, was so, it diaries or? Yeah, so it was kind of like openly talked about at the time. So her and Juan especially were like really open about it. They didn't really care who knew. Um, and the same thing with Cesare, it kind of just like leaked out that this relationship was happening. 
Um, supposedly, again, when you're going this far back, it's kind of, who knows for sure, but supposedly she took up with Cesare first and then moved on to Juan. And then um, she actually died pretty young. She was only like in her late 20s, early 30s, I think, when she died. Um, she had, yeah, she had kind of a sad life. And she actually, when Cesare was kind of, this would have been after this book ends, but when he was kind of coming, he did end up becoming a general and leading armies. He actually had her imprisoned in the Castel San Angelo. And I for off the top of my head, I forget why, but he had her locked up in there for a while. So, um, and then she eventually was let out. She became the mistress of yet another cardinal. Um, and then she died of, I, I want to say maybe the plague. I forget. I forget exactly. But she had kind of a sad life, unfortunately. <laughs> that is, you know, one of the reasons I like reading historical fiction is that it usually makes me feel better about how things are today. I'm like, oh, at least it's not the French Revolution and people aren't cutting my head off. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I think it could always be worse. <laughs> so yeah. we have to keep remembering. <laughs> yeah. So, Rachel, do you want us to pause to? Yeah, this is a good time. If people have questions, um, please put them into the chat and we can ask them out from there. Either Davith or I will read them out. Um, a reminder, we are recording this. Um, if you unmute and talk into your camera, you'll be part of the recording, um, which is great. If you want to do that, if you do want to ask a question on camera, just send a message to either me or Davith and we will let you know when you can unmute and ask a question. Um, and I'd love to ask you both as we're waiting for audience questions to come in, um, Carrie, you hinted a little bit that you're researching Granada. Um, I'd love to hear what you're both working on now, if, if you don't mm. mind sharing. Um, sure, I'll talk a little bit about it. This, this book isn't sold yet, so um, it's in the very tender baby stages. Um, but generally, I'm looking at uh, a story set in Granada during the Spanish Civil War mm. that is, I'll just say it's a feminist retelling of a well-known classical work of literature. But, not say anything hmm. more than that. Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, I'm very intrigued. Um, so I kind of have two projects on my plate at the moment. Um, one that I'm waiting for notes on for my agent, but that one is also set in Renaissance Italy, but it is about, uh, it's set in Venice, and it's about uh, the, the history of the Venetian courtesans, which were, um, they were sex workers. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, courtesan was a, a sex worker, but very high class. Um, and part of what she provided was not only sex, but also, um, you know, she was usually musically talented. She could converse. She was. She could write poetry. You know, they were. It was kind of this, this sort of all service <laughs> experience, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's also about the history of the Venetian Council of Ten, which was the Venetian intelligence service, and they were kind of like. The 10 were kind of like if you took the CIA, the Secret Service, the FBI, and Homeland Security and like combined them all into one. <laughs> so it's, it's about uh, those kind of two worlds of Venetian Renaissance history. And then I'm also currently wrapping up some research for a dual timeline historical, which is set both in present day-ish uh, Western Massachusetts and then in Western Massachusetts in the late 1600s. So kind of juggling two things right now, but. That's what I got going on. Are there any echoes of your Katrina Van Tassel book there? Yes, it's very witchy and it's very spooky. <laughs> so I'm having fun with that, especially now that it's becoming fall and Halloween is approaching. I'm like, yay, spooky witch book. <laughs> That's all awesome. about it. That's fun. So we have a question in the chat from Meredith. She asked, um, she says, thank you, both of you. This has been great. Um, and she'd love to know if you're interested ever in writing in other genres besides historical fiction at some point. That is a tough question because I have so many stories I want to write in historical fiction that I would have to kind of clear the queue before I could make creative space. Um, I would probably enjoy someday um, writing historical fantasy or even just fantasy, which if this is a Meredith, I think it is. I think she writes some historical fantasy as well. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that seems like a long ways away because it's so hard to find time for the projects I already have on the, the close end of the queue. What about you, Alyssa? Yeah, so same actually. I am really interested in writing um, like high fantasy or historical fantasy someday. I have like the starts of a couple of projects, but it's never been kind of, as you said, like the right time to really dig in. Um, 
I kind of would like to write contemporary at some point too. I do have a few ideas that I think, um, you know, are, are contemporary stories. Um, but yeah, we'll see. You know, I never say never. Um, but I think, I don't think I'd ever completely abandon historical fiction. I think I will always write that as well. But I think I would at some point like to do other things in addition to that. It's interesting that you say you want to write contemporary because I think that would probably be the hardest for me just because I have grown so comfortable using, in a way, using history as a shield. Yeah. You know, like I said at the beginning, I, I think we're telling contemporary stories, but we're doing it from this distance that at least for me, I think allows readers to engage with those contemporary issues with a lot less emotional defensiveness maybe. Yeah. Uh, like writing about women's ambition and writing about politics and all of those things. I like using the distance of history to get at that. Um, I don't think I would have the courage to write a contemporary story. <laughs> do you think you could do it? Yeah, so I actually have one contemporary manuscript on the back burner that I, I really love and I don't, I hope it gets published someday, but I don't know, but it's actually about, it's about a heavy metal band. <laughs> um, and I just wrote it because it was fun. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes my agent, when she's read some of my contemporary stuff, or even this dual timeline, when I mentioned like the contemporary section, she's like, your tone sounds too historical somehow. She's like, it doesn't quite sound how people today talk, which you think would not be a problem because I am a person in the present and I <laughs> talk to people, but it, it's harder to switch off that kind of historical voice, I guess, than, than you would think it is. That's really funny. <laughs> There's a question here, Carrie, from your friend Erin. She asks, uh, how much time do you need to take between projects to, uh, to disengage from one and then start another? Oh, it's more like, how do I stop the projects from eating me alive because I want to do them all at once? Um, so for me, it's usually like, you know, I'm, I'm researching one thing and I'm trying to immerse myself in it as much as possible. But then like there's this other thing I'm curious about. And it's, so it starts nibbling at the edges a little bit. Um, I see Alyssa nodding. Is that how you feel too? Yeah, I always want to work on the thing that I'm not working on at that particular time. <laughs> like it always seems the, the project that you can't work on right then is always the sexy one that you want to like really attack. Um, but yeah, I, I need at least a month. Um, even between projects, but also between drafts for myself as well. Like once I finish a first draft, I can't look at it for at least a month. I have yeah. to get some distance from it before I can come back. Um, and then, yeah, to kind of pull myself from one world into another. Um, yeah, the more time, the better. I mean, with deadlines and stuff, I don't always get as long as I'd like, but I try to build that time in as much as I can. Yeah, definitely for the writing part of it, it does help to have some space. Mm -hmm. um, for both evaluating what you've written. I mean, obviously anybody who's writing needs a little bit of space before you can edit yourself. Um, but also, yeah, I guess there is a bit of a mind shift, but still it feels more like a crashing wave and I wish I could do it all. Yeah. I've always wondered with historical fiction, is there a point where research becomes too much? Is there a point where you have to cut yourself off, stop yourself because it almost becomes a tool of procrastination or is it more knowledge is always a beautiful thing? So I feel like I kind of have the opposite problem where not that I don't like the research and obviously, you know, obviously I do it because it's a huge part of the process, but I like the writing better than the research. So for me, it's always making sure I do enough because I'm so eager to get back to telling the story. Um, but I think kind of how I know when I'm, again, quote unquote, done, even though you're, you're kind of always looking things up at different uh, parts of the publishing process, but when I keep finding the same information over and over again in different sources um, is when I tend to know that, okay, I think I'm good. I think I have enough. Um, and again, I, I, my books are all set further back in the past, so it, I have usually limited, more limited sources than Carrie Wood or than someone else writing like the 20th century. Um, like I said before, that seems to me like it's just a bottomless well <laughs> of things. I have noticed in myself, like for this project that I'm working on right now, that sometimes the research does turn into procrastination <laughs> because I'm afraid. Um, and so there's, there's sort of a side aspect of this story that takes place in Argentina. And the other night I found myself 
spending two hours trying to figure out what it was something really pedantic about 1931 Argentina and like a street. And I realized, you know what, you are just procrastinating. This is not essential. You can move on. Oh, I remember what it was. I was trying to find out the printing press the government used to print export customs forms. Like nobody here is interested in that. That doesn't matter. I just needed to stop. Um, <laughs> But you know, it was two hours later that I realized that. So it does, it yeah. definitely happens. Uh, but like Alyssa said, for me, it's like once I kind of have this sense of, of satiety, then that's when I know that I'm probably okay to move on and that anything else is, is just extraneous. I'm, I've got a question for both of you. I'm, I'm a little curious as about how uh, historical fiction writers avoid anachronism. Do you sort of consciously watch out for it or sets yourself goals later on to strip it out? Just curiosity. Yeah, so that's one of those things that you try to catch them all. And I think sometimes there's probably things that I have missed that um, are in the books. But um, I tend to think about that more with when I'm revising. Um, I try to not, I mean, obviously, you know, there's things that are obviously anachronistic, like you wouldn't have, you know, a cell phone in, in whatever time period. Um, but I think it's important not to assume. Um, so actually an example from the Borgia Confessions is, I, you know, I had written the first draft I was going through and revising, and there's a scene where Madalena hands Lucrezia a towel. And I was like, wait, were towels a thing? <laughs> like, obviously they clearly had some kind of cloth they dried themselves with after a bath, but like, was it a towel? Was it called that? So I went down this kind of um, internet rabbit hole about towels and long story short towels as we think of them today were invented in turkey in the 1600s um, so they would not have used that word and it would not have been kind of like what we think of as a towel so i was like she hands her a cloth <laughs> that seems to work um so yeah you just you have to kind of watch for it and it's it's tough because again i catch that more when i'm revising um when i draft i kind of try to let myself go and just get it down and then i go back and fix things later yeah, I agree. It, it mostly tends to play out in revision, unless it's a big plot point, in which case, you know, at this mm -hmm. point, I've done enough historical fiction right. writing that I realize that I need to question every aspect of existence, you know, whether yeah. it's how someone turns on a light um, to, you know, how they dress or whatever. Um, and then another thing I found this helpful is just getting other historical fiction writers to read it because I don't know everything and other people are really helpful in finding that. And then I'm going to drop this one really fun link into the chat, which is a great tool for folks who are just curious about the origin of words. But sometimes when I have a word and I'm wondering if it's period appropriate, I'll check on the uh, oh. etymology online to see. But you know what, like my attitude towards anachronisms and mistakes in general is that the point of accuracy in historical fiction is to to allow the fictional dream to persist and so we don't want a mistake so big that it pulls somebody out of the fictional dream and for every reader that's going to vary like some a friend was telling me that somebody sent him an email saying that there weren't any this particular type of blue jay in ohio in the mid 19th century and he was like sorry um <laughs> But for most people, that mistake will not pull them out of the fictional dream. Right. And, you know, you really just can't control for that one reader who's a Blue Jay uh, fan. Right. Um, but, you know, so like, that's my attitude. Like, you know, I'll do my best um, if I've made mistakes, you know, I'll just try to fix them. But, you know, we're, yeah. we're human and it's art. I agree. The one anachronism I actually see a lot in historical fiction that makes me crazy is the piano. The piano was invented way after a lot of people think it was. But I, I did a lot of music and music history in college. So like, again, that's just a thing that I know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Always bugs me. But, Everyone will yeah. have their own particular yeah. pet peeve that, you know, I saw somebody call um, the OSS the CIA. And, you know, as somebody who studied that in grad school, that was really irritating to me. There was mm -hmm. no CIA in 1940. It was called the um, Office of Strategic Services. So, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> I would not have caught that one. There's yeah. a, a thing called the Tiffany problem, which mm, is that mm -hmm. the name Tiffany was a real name that was really in use in the Middle Ages. But if a historical fiction author put a character named Tiffany in a, maybe a novel set in the Middle Ages, audience members would be instantly pulled out, just like you were saying, yeah. Mary, they would be pulled out of the dream because to our modern minds, Tiffany is a name that was from the 80s and that's it. 
Yeah, and, totally. Um, and you could you might have noticed me kind of working around that problem when I read that excerpt when I was I had to explain why she saw a Ford on the streets of Moscow in 1934 because early readers were like, well, that's not true. There weren't Fords there. That was it's an American car. Like, well, no, actually, that was the only car. <laughs> So we are just about out of time. I wondered if either of you had any last thoughts that you wanted. Oh, oh, actually, sorry. Uh, an attendee in the chat, which I'll just ask Margaret's question, was what types of books, and this will be, then you can go ahead. What types of books did you like to read as you were growing up? Mm. You go first, Carrie. Well, my answer is pretty short, uh, or the short version of it is everything. I read everything I could get my hands on and, um, all the time. I was the kid who was staying up late with the flashlight under the covers mm -hmm. reading. Um, but I do remember the first book that got me set on historical fiction, and it was relatively young, and I just reread it with my own kids, um, called Knight's Castle by uh, Edward Eager. And it's about children who sort of travel back in time from Baltimore, Maryland, near where I live, um, and they relive Ivanhoe in a kind of twisted way, in a way that I didn't remember. <laughs> but so. Yeah, I, yeah, I kind of read everything too. Um, growing up there, that's my phone. Sorry, I'm gonna hang up. <laughs> it was inevitable that either a phone or oh, yeah. a child would interrupt us yeah. at some point. So don't worry about it. It's my grandparents, the only people living that still call my landline. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, yeah, there was a little library down the street from me uh, when I grew up and it was very small. So I read like everything they had <laughs> that I hadn't read pretty much. Um, but I did really love historical fiction. I loved fantasy as well. Um, I, I was kind of growing up when those Dear America books were coming out and then also the, the Royal Diaries or something like that. But they were... Um, you know, kind of written in diary format from people from different, um, you know, points of view. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. But um, yeah, historical fiction was something I, I really loved early on too. And I think that's kind of what drew me to writing about it. Well, fantastic. I think we are just about out of time. And Alyssa, you need to call your grandparents back so they yes. aren't worried. <laughs> um, thank you, both of you, for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Thank you to the audience for a lovely evening. We will be back tomorrow evening for a poetry reading, uh, co-presented with our wonderful friend Kate Gatto, with the wonderful poet and photographer Rachel Eliza Griffiths. So come on back tomorrow if you're free. And then we have more great events all night, all, sorry, all month, that you can check out at Northshire.com. Thank you, Carrie and Alyssa, for a wonderful evening, and thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks to you both for having us, and thanks to everyone who attended. It was a lot of fun. And Alyssa, thank your grandparents for sharing thank you with so us. Much, <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thanks.